In the very beginning, when I started working there for a federal security agency in Brazil, we would have self-defense classes. When that happened, I thought, well, it's time to go back to martial arts. Welcome. You're tuned in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 486, with today's guest, Sensei Samir Berardo. If you don't know my name, my voice, I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and I am a passionate martial artist. And everything we do here is in support of the traditional martial arts. We do that in a lot of different ways. If you want to see all the things that we're doing, go to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's also the easiest way to find the stuff that we make. Yes, we make products, physical things that you might want to check out if you buy one of them or more than one. Use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Everything for this show is on a whole different website. That's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The show comes out twice a week. And the goal of this show and of Whistlekick overall, well, we're working hard to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to show your appreciation for what we're doing, you can do quite a few things. You can make a purchase or share an episode, follow our social media, tell a friend, pick up a book on Amazon, we're constantly adding new titles. You can leave a review or support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. Patreon's a place where we post exclusive content, written audio, video, and you can get access to more content by contributing as little as $2 a month. We're at an interesting time in traditional martial arts. We have people talking about modern martial arts and the mixture or blending of martial arts. And we have people who are passionate about martial arts that had to be rediscovered, like historical European martial arts. Today's guest is really passionate about what he calls traditional or historical karate. And we have a long conversation about that and what that all means and whether or not you're a karate practitioner. I think you're going to like this one. Because as we talk about historical karate, we're talking about a lot of other things, things that are relevant regardless of what you train. So here's my conversation with Sensei Samir Berardo. What's going on? What's good? Did I did I interrupt something? No, not at all. I was studying <laughs> Japanese. Oh, cool. You know, with the headset on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many languages do you know? About four, including Japanese, Already. That, but I'm not very good at Japanese okay. at the point. I'll okay. be good at it. I've, I've always impressed at people when 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 they decide, you know. I was raised with one language and, yeah. and then I learned another language and, and I'm going to keep going. So wh- what are the other languages? Obviously English. Yeah. Uh, I speak Spanish and Portuguese. So okay. that's English, Spanish, Portuguese, and a little Japanese. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would have guessed Spanish by the name. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in Brazil, we, we speak Portuguese, but Spanish and Portuguese are very similar. So it's... and. Uh, most countries around here, the neighboring countries, speak Spanish. So it's kind of easy for us to speak Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. We. Yeah. Okay. So, I, so I would have been wrong, but close. Yeah. In, the, in that it's Portuguese. Yeah. It, it's funny. I I can get by in Spanish. Yeah. I can't get by in Portuguese, but if it's written, I can figure it out because the accent is seems to be a lot more different than the spelling. Indeed, that, that's true. Also, people who speak Portuguese find it easier to understand Spanish than people who speak Spanish uh, can understand Portuguese. Oh, yes, fascinating. That's, that's peculiar. <laughs> Why is that? Do you know? I, I don't know for sure, but Spanish speakers have told me about that many times. Yeah, I... The extent of my Portuguese is is pretty much counting to 10 from my time in Capoeira. Oh, <laughs> if you ever come to Brazil, uh, we can make that change. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I would help you a lot. Well, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate that. Yeah, if, if you're good with it, let's just let's just keep going. Sure. <laughs> let's just keep going. I mean, we've, we've got some conversation going and, and, you know, I have no idea if the listeners like this part of the, the show, but I don't care because I do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's your show. <laughs> just... It is my show. Yeah. It is my show. And I, I should I should get to enjoy this part of it. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for your, your willingness to join uh, us. Yes. I, thank you for inviting me. I'm very glad to be of here. Of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. So are you in Brazil now? Yes, I am. Um, okay. So we. it's 4, so 4 p.m. right now. Okay. A couple, couple hours. Yeah. A couple hours ahead. It's 2 o'clock here. And what have you done so far today? 
Well, um, today was a, a special day for two reasons. First of all, is that it's Carnival Day here in Brazil. Mm. Yes, yeah, so it's holiday. There are many people in the streets, you know, dancing, having fun. Uh, I didn't go to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But also, it's a special day because of this very interview. It's oh, thank you. It's not something I do every day. <laughs> and, yeah, <laughs> and and I was kind of there was a great deal of expectations. Just a few minutes ago, I was messaging messaging some of my students, saying, "Hey guys, uh, a few minutes from now, it's going to be the interview. I'm gonna I'm I'm excited and kind of nervous." Yeah, so that's what I was doing. But uh, I was also, there are things that I do every day, like studying Japanese. <laughs> every day? Yeah, every day. And how long, how long have you been doing that? For about two years, but consistently just for the past year. Okay. Yeah. Now, everyone has different reasons for studying languages. Yeah. I'm going to guess yours has something to do with your training. Uh, sure, sure, because... Um, the most important sources of the martial arts which I practice are written in Japanese. Yeah, especially the, the historical sources, which are surely the most important. I practice a st historical martial arts, so I need to go search in historical sources. What do you mean when you say you practice a historical yeah, but, martial art? I, 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 I think I know what you mean, but I don't think I've ever heard anyone put it in that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, indeed, I, I think that's a peculiar way of uh, coining it. But it's because I could say that I'm a karate practitioner. But if I say that, really, most people will get the a very wrong figure. Because they'll, they'll think of what is typically known as karate. In, in fact, even this name, karate, is a... Uh, a modern name, right? Uh, mm. There were old names. And the kind of karate, the, the historical karate, when it used to be practiced fully as a martial arts, as, as a self-defense martial arts, this historical kind of karate was really extremely different from the modern kind of karate. Both are great, both are beautiful, but they're really very different. Uh, both are in and uh, what they're for, modern karate is made for different things and also technically. Technically, they are completely different. Can you speak to some of those differences? Because yeah, sure. I, I, I think you know most of the people listening, whether or not they train yeah. in karate, will understand what modern, yeah. what, what we can call modern karate yes. is. But I doubt very many people have an understanding of what you're calling historical, yeah. so I'm interested. Uh, also, I think this is uh, something useful for everyone who practices martial arts with historical roots because karate went through a process that many other ma martial arts have been to, or similarly, uh, most historical martial arts that have survived to this day have gone through a modernization process so karate is one among those and historically karate had just one uh, one main reason was self-defense that that was not karate with this name because it's a modern name sometime in the past they would call it tode or toji uh, different names but um it was very different in the fact that it was it aimed for self defense the techniques uh there were there were different methodologies of teaching because uh every teacher every every practitioner would have their own kind of karate but there was one thing most important of of all which would be the use of kata, the forms. Yeah. Uh, also, mm -hmm. other martial arts use forms, such as uh, Chinese martial arts and Taekwondo. So, uh, kata was far more important for karate, for old-style karate, historical karate, than it is 
today because kata was a way of really um, summing up of recording the the actual fighting techniques of old style karate of historical karate um, for example if we train together i teach you stuff or you teach me stuff and in the end uh, we sum up everything that has been taught in one kata uh, not necessarily uh, we're the ones creating the kata we, we can be practicing a kata that has been created by someone else but the point the most important point thing here is that the kata that kata we know exactly what we're doing we know the meaning of every movement because it's just a, a consolidation of the techniques that we're practicing it's not, we don't practice the kata uh, not knowing the meaning of the movements. Uh, this is a, a, um, somewhat of a sens sensitive subject because for the recent years, recent decades, um, there has been a lot of confusion about the meaning of the katas. Uh, it's very popular, one kind of idea that people think that of oh, the the kata can be used for anything, but that's surely not true. In, in fact, the, the movements of kata have correct meanings, his, historical meanings. And those meanings can be brought back through research, through historical research, through scientific research, in fact. Um, it's many different scientific disciplines that can help bringing back the meaning of kata. So this is the most important difference between old style karate and modern karate is that old style karate was practiced with correct understanding, with original understanding of the meaning of the movements, especially not only the meaning of the movement, movements, but also how the idea, the very idea of kata works because most people don't understand that. It's nobody's fault. That's very important to to mention. It's not a. Uh, it's not to blame the practitioners or the instructors. The fact is that they haven't been taught how it works. So how can they uh, practice something that they haven't been taught? How how can they right. teach something that they haven't been taught? Um, now that that was the formal difference difference the formal difference is the use of kata but the practical difference technically the way of fighting is that um, karate uh, as a self-defense martial art uh, has no limitations uh, in terms of rules of uh, kinds of strikes of kinds of techniques it's not a grappling art as some seem to be saying today karate old style karate is not a grappling art it's just a, a mixed art uh, mm. i could say a mixed martial art but i don't like the idea very much because the 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 word the phrasing mixed martial art often seems to mean mean something like sport yeah. karate was yeah. not uh, a sport there, there were no rules and this changes everything. Um, but one point is that old style karate will, would use grappling, indeed, grappling techniques, would, would use striking, throwing, pressure to, um, to more exposed parts of the human body, like the eyes, the testicles, attacks to, to areas which are forbidding in any kind of fighting sport. Um, so, but they wouldn't practice that separately as people often do today. People go to a grappling school and then they go to a striking school. Um, if it works, that's great. But there was little point to do that because when you fight for your life, you should use anything, anything available. So there's no reason to separate kinds of techniques. And in fact, um, in old style karate people, uh, practitioners don't, uh, it's not only a matter of not separating. 
the fact is that old style karate uses everything together, sometimes even at the same time. So, for example, you pull someone's arm uh, and you can perform a joint lock on their arm, for example, against the, the elbow joint. Um, and at the same time, you, you strike them on the head, on a vital point on the head, for example, the jaw, the, the back of the head. So you do it at the same time. And that's very good because uh, when the opponent is trying to, to protect from one kind of strike, he might suffer the other kind. Uh, the, the defender, because karate is a defensive art, the defender uh, strikes the aggressor on the head, the aggressor is trying to defend his head, and when he does that, he suffers a joint lock at the very same time. And he couldn't protect from the joint lock because his attention was focused on the on the head, on the strike to the head. So that's sure. a very peculiar aspect of old sire karate. It's not unique to old sire karate. There are other old martial arts that do the same. Sometimes modern martial arts do uh, something similar, but I don't think as, as sophisticated as it would happen in karate, in old style karate. But that was, that was one kind of fighting technology, fighting knowledge that was really advanced at that time because uh, that was something that they would need for real. That's something very special. I believe this is very special regarding historical martial arts. Today, we practice martial arts for many reasons and even for self-defense. I'm myself a self-defense teacher at work, so we practice them, but we don't use them nearly as often as people from uh, ancient times would use because we're in a a far more peaceful world uh, today. Sure. Yes, it's a safer world. Yeah. So, for example, if I practice a martial art for 10 years, that doesn't mean that my martial art needs to work because uh, it's very unlikely that, I, that I'll need that martial art to work. And uh, what could happen? I can become a teacher without ever having needed to use my martial art. Uh, so <laughs> something very peculiar happens. Uh, a teacher who has never fought will teach other people. Uh, oh, okay, I can I can fight. Yes, for sport, and that's very good. I'm uh, I I'm not dismissing the importance, the utility of training for sport. That's really extremely useful and good. But it's just a different world, you know. Um, it may work, the martial art, the modern martial art that people are practicing may work, there's no problem. But even if it doesn't work, uh, that martial art can still be passed on to other people and so on, to future generations and so on. But in old martial arts, if it doesn't, know, it does, if it doesn't work, uh, you're gone. You die, <laughs> or, the, or, or you, you don't die, but there's no point to pass it on because people in no times wouldn't practice art, martial arts for a hobby. They, they wouldn't be interested in, they have other stuff to do. So um, with, in, in their different world, it was necessary for martial arts to work. If even if people learn a martial art that doesn't work, okay, they learn a martial art that doesn't work, but as soon as they need that martial art, they're gone and the techniques will, will not be passed on to future generations. That's very special because if we can get to the old martial arts, we find out that it's, it's like, you know, survival of the fittest. It's a, a natural selection of techniques uh, that have been used in different generations. For example, um, the A martial artist uh, needs to use his martial arts. Uh, some, some of those techniques work, some of them don't work, but he survives. So he survives uh, 
from the occasions in which his some of his martial uh, his techniques didn't work okay this a person this a person is going to teach only what worked to the b person and the b person is going to need the martial arts again the techniques again and the b person is going to learn from many different people and that this second person the b person is only going to pass on what worked again and so on for many generations so the result is uh, a huge amount of great knowledge accumulated and this accumulated knowledge is uh, formalized is um, um, it's conserved it's it's passed on through kata so kata is the accumulated knowledge of many people many generations for myself when i study kata and sometimes i i see something and i and I think, I talk to my students, my students feel the same. How can someone come up with this? This is genius. This, this is not a gr the work of one person. But that's the very point. It's not really the work of one person. It's many people teaching each other. And the process goes on, uh, leading to a greater fighting technology, self-defense technology. It's, I, I like... Uh, comparing it to technology because technology is about the same. Uh, the future generations build upon what the uh, the generations that came before what they have already discovered. But the difficult today with mar modern martial arts is that the context, the context of using modern martial arts is different. So what does that mean? Survival of the Fit, fittest natural selection uh, tends to work differently today. So people will select not what works better for self-defense, for example, but they can select what works better for specific uh, sport contexts. Or it depends on what they are doing with that their martial arts. The the natural selection can become the the evolution of the martial art can become. Um, the selection of what looks better. And is that good? I think it's good. But it's important to understand the differences between them. Uh, the big mm -hmm. difference, uh, the biggest differences between old style karate, historical karate for, uh, that used to be practiced in the Yukyu Kingdom, which today is Okinawa Prefecture in Japan, um, that martial art that used to be practiced in the Yukyu Kingdom was a self-defense art. It was meant solely for self-defense, for life protection. Uh, it, it, would, it would also be useful to protect your life in terms of giving you uh, a good, uh, of making you healthier. You would be healthier by practicing martial arts. That's actually still a, a benefit today of practicing martial arts if we mm, of if, course. yes if we yeah. practice um smart smart uh, in a smart way of course because um martial arts can be good or bad for the half depending on how we practice them but they would protect the lives of the practitioners both in times of peace and of violence there were no competitions, no, not a lot of demonstrations. There, was, there wasn't this culture of today of martial arts for fun or for uh, other kinds of enjoyment. So those are the, the differences. But if I seem to have left some hole please just ask. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you're, you're good. And, and right out the gate, I mean, we, we get the theme of, of what we're here to talk about today. You okay. know, every, every guest comes on. And, and one of the things I like about our format is it gives the guests the opportunity to talk about the things that are important to them <laughs> within martial arts. For some, it's, uh, it's their accomplishments. It's the things that they've seen. It's overcoming adversity. And here with you, we're talking about the differences between my, martial arts currently and martial arts historically yeah uh, uh, where where would you draw that line like when you're talking about historical karate yeah 
what time period are we talking about? Okay, that's a very good question because <laughs> uh, it's not simple. When I talk about when we talk about period, uh, we can only the maybe the only um, certain way of answering is somewhere in time where when the kata had been established. Uh, I don't know exactly when, but for example, if I practice one specific kata, uh, for example, uh, a popular kata, Naihanchi uh, Shodan, it, it's a very popular kata in karate, in, in Japanese karate, some schools such as Shotoka uh, call it Tekki Shodan. Um, right. If we practice uh, this kata sh specifically, uh, we know that is uh, is it comes from uh, some somewhere before the the turn of the century, uh, from 19th to 20th century. But we can't be sure when it was created. Uh, we just know that we are practicing something from the time when the, they created that kata. Uh, it's a very conditional lens answer. It, it's not uh, linked to a specific, a specific time level. The level is a kata. So the techniques, we know that some, somewhere in the past, uh, they, they would be established in the kata, naihanchi shodan. Uh, but we don't know exactly when. Uh, I, could, I could tell you that uh, old sayakurari uh, would be, still be practiced in the old style way until about around the turn of 19th to 20th century. That's when they started teaching karate for other reasons, uh, which were not self-defense. They started mm -hmm. teaching karate. Uh, in that time, they wouldn't call it karate. They would call it toji or toji in the Uchinaguchi language, which was... Um, an Okinawan language, a language that would come from the Yukyo kingdom. And uh, in the turn of the century, in the beginning of 20th century, they started teaching karate as a form of physical education uh, to, to young students of the school system in Okinawa. So that's when they started teaching karate openly to many people uh, before that time the the classes would be private would be mostly a one on one uh, private instruction and um uh, when karate it starts to to be taught as a form of physical education that's the 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 um, landmark that's when we know that that it started to be changed to to modern karate. Uh, it's not the only the only special point, but it's probably the most important point that uh, s sets apart old style karate from modern karate. But we don't know for sure how many centuries centuries it had been practiced before. Um, uh, the history of karate. Uh, lacks um, good sources. We have a, a lot of written, good written sources that have been um, have been created in the turn of the century. That's very good, very important. But before that, they wouldn't have the the uh, the they wouldn't uh, make make writings about karate everything would be passed on orally uh, so we can't say for sure uh, probably something about um from one two centuries uh, uh regarding the influence of chinese in okinawa and to maybe four or five six centuries because uh the immigration of a few families a uh, few Chinese families to Okinawa um, amounts to to a few centuries. Like, for, um, I don't know, um, 
for sure the how many centuries, but it's probably about five or six centuries. And those Chinese who came to started living in Okinawa, that is the Yukyu Kingdom, um, are probably the ones who we can't say for sure, but probably the ones who made the greatest influence to establish one specific martial art that today we could call old style karate. There would be other martial arts that would come before, uh, still in the Yukyu kingdom, but before the Chinese influence, it's surely something different. Uh, the, the most, what defines karate as what, is it, what it is, is the use of forms of kata. And most likely, uh, the practitioners in the Yukyu kingdom started using forms after the Chinese, the Chinese families uh, immigrated to the uh, Kume village in the Yukyu kingdom. So that's probably um, five, four or five centuries ago. Wow. Yeah. And how did you start down this path? I mean, it was, was this how martial arts was originally taught to you? Or did you start in a different way and find yeah, yeah. this? Uh, I believe most practitioners who, who are trying to find the, the first martial arts that satisfy them the most, they, it's normal for, for them to make a, a path with many different stops and turns. And mine was like that. My first contact with martial arts was when I was uh, about 12. Um, and the city I was born in, it was Belém, Belém in the region of Pará in Brazilian Amazonia, Amazonia Amazon. And uh, it was actually capoeira in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I think uh, <laughs> it's if I asked you, you you would be able to guess that. <laughs> so I well, the, those are the, those are the two Brazilian martial arts that I know of. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but Belém is a very dangerous city, a very dangerous place. I'm not proud to say that, but it's true. Uh, it's been uh, considered one of the most uh, ten most dangerous cities, uh, big cities in the world. And since I was very young, uh, I would see the violence i i've had m various friends who were killed and that kind of stuff so uh when i practiced uh, capoeira and brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, especially capoeira because i i liked it the most it was something that everyone would practice for example at school or after a soccer match we would uh, play soccer and after that we would keep practicing capoeira or Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And actually, this, both of them together, yeah, uh, I practiced in a time that people would uh, have a roda de capoeira, uh, you know, a capoeira play together. The people would uh, play with each other and suddenly they went to the ground. <laughs> I never liked that too much because I liked the standing game of capoeira, but that was something that we would do. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. as violence is very present in our lives, um, people would use martial arts for fighting. Uh, it's important to notice that I'm talking about fighting, uh, like street fights and not self-defense. Uh, they are very different things. Uh, and I'm not proud at all to, be, to have been part of street fights when I was young. I practiced those martial arts for about uh, four years, five years, and, um, you know, un until one day I fought in front of a teacher. Uh, uh, actually, it was a school teacher, and he, he was like a father figure to me, and he saw, saw me fighting, and he, he, he told me that was, I had done a very bad thing. I was so ashamed that after that I never had a street fight again. Uh, anyway, um, when uh, in that time there were also many bullies. Um, that was indeed one of the reasons why why I would practice martial arts. 
And I really learned a lot on how to, to have street fights against those bullies, you know, to protect myself and sometimes to protect my friend. Uh, I kept doing that for a few years after, until I finished school, I went to college and I started work very, working very young. So I stopped practicing martial arts at all um, because, you know, I had to study and work. Uh, there was no time to practice martial arts. But after I graduated, graduated from college, um, I, I, I got a really good job, a government job. And uh, I had finished college and finally I had a good job. And in, the, in that job, I would have self-defense classes. In the very beginning, when I started working there, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, for a federal security agency in Brazil, we would have self-defense classes. And when that happened, I thought, wow, it's time to go back to martial arts. So it was like 12 years ago. And uh, I never stopped. And I actually never stopped for one day. But when I, when I went back to martial arts, my first teacher would be a karate teacher. And he made a very strong impression on me. He said, I hope you keep practicing after uh, we finish those self-defense classes. And that's exactly what I did. But, you know, I... I trained with many different instructors because I thought to myself, I understand that people um, practice martial arts for many different reasons, uh, but uh, I want to practice a martial arts that makes me feel that it works, uh, that it works for fighting. Not only that it's beautiful, not only that it's healthy, I wanted to work for fighting, especially to protect myself because I've had self-defense classes and I, I want to take this to the next level. So I went to one school and then to another. Uh, I not only practiced karate, in the meantime, I, I practiced uh, taekwondo. I, I, had a, I got a black belt in taekwondo. I got a black belt in Shotokan karate. I practiced judo. I practiced krav maga. Krav maga and uh, I just stuck to old style karate, to what? I have found to be old style karate because it was what seems seems to be to me the most effective um, martial art method that I would know to for self defense. I'm not telling that it's the most effective martial arts method. I don't know because I don't know all martial arts, and I I just know a, a little more about. Old, old style karate, but it was mm. the most effective one which I came across. And um, after a while, I started myself teaching self defense classes at work. And people who practiced other martial arts as well would recognize that as being those techniques, those old style karate techniques, they would agree with me. Wow, man, I, I have never seen this before. And, and it really seems to work very well. Even my judo instructors, they, they would agree. I, I've had students and instructors that when we began practicing for self-defense uh, context, they would agree, yes, this is, this is great. Um, uh, not, not that I, I have what's, what's greatest. I'm just a student. But... I'm looking for what works the best, um, and it worked for me. That's it. Yeah, and I think that that quest is something that's not unique. I think most of us who venture out from our first martial art, yeah, are looking for something more. We're looking for whether it's something that works better from our mind in a practical sense or a sport sense, yeah. or fits our, our body type better, we're, we're often looking for that. And I, I think that that's really important. And one of my favorite things about martial arts is that there are different 
Yeah, exactly. Types. Oh, and different ways to approach them. You just said something. You you said that uh, the martial arts are different, and I totally agree with you. But just a few days ago, I saw in the internet some someone saying uh, it was like a you know a famous person saying this is not not important, but. Uh, I believe some people may think that martial arts are like all the same in the end, but it's not true. They are different, but they're different for what reasons? The main reason why, why they are different, that's what I think, is that they're made for different reasons, for different contexts. So, for example, uh, a, sport, a sport martial arts made for a specific sport context, for example, a jiu-jitsu, jiu Brazilian jiu-jitsu competition, it's, it's made for that kind of context. So it will be necessarily different for, from uh, uh, another martial arts made for a another sport context and both of them are sport martial arts both both of them are very effective in their specific contexts but they are very different because they, they they're not meant to do the same things and even if we have uh, martial arts we, which aren't for sport for example like uh Uh, quotation marks, uh, real fighting, you know, fight to the death, martial arts, they can be very different. They can still be very different. For example, if you get uh, martial arts with weapons, they, they, they will be very different from martial arts with, without weapons. That should be obvious, but that shows that martial arts are different. But even if you get two martial arts with the very same weapons, they can be different. For example, if you get, if you get sword, sword martial arts, Japanese sword martial arts made for um, military use, they will be different from m Japanese martial arts made for duels. When you're, you're a soldier, you... You have a very different way of fighting because you may have uh, body armor. Your opponent may have body armor. Um, uh, there may be many opponents at the same time. You may have uh, your other soldiers on your side as well. And a duel is a totally different thing. And if I am a, a police officer, for, for example, so uh, that's a totally hypo Theoretical example, but if I am uh, a law enforcement officer in all Japan, uh, my way of using my martial arts will will also be different from the way that a a person will use in a duel or a person will use in the battlefield. That's very different. A, a police officer is not supposed to kill his opponent immediately. Um, a police officer is not supposed to, to run away. Uh, neither should a, uh, a soldier, uh, neither should a, uh, someone uh, engaging in a duel, but someone who only fights for self-defense can run away. That's something that you can do when you, you're Uh, using martial arts for self-defense. So the contexts are very different. If you're uh, a woman, if you're, if you're not physically very strong, your martial arts tend to reflect uh, your, your physique, your body. And you're, if you're very strong, if you're big, you know, a big man uh, who can take advantage of your strength, your martial arts will, will also re reflect this. So martial arts are, in fact, very different uh, from each other for that reason. Um, even self-defense martial arts will be different from each other. So what we can do is look for what fits better the many aspects of what we want. The, our body type, as you, just as you have, you said, you said, the body type, the, the kind of application of the martial arts, and all of those details. For that reason, martial arts are 
actually very different. So even self-defense martial arts are different from each other. But if the context is completely the same, of course, uh, different martial arts tend to look more and more similar. And that's a historical fact, indeed. Yeah, one of my, this certainly isn't my observation or, or comment, but I've heard some people say that martial arts, when you start out, look very different. Yeah. But the more time you spend with them, the better you get, the more you understand, the more similar. That's true they to become. some extent. That is true. But, you know, it's like uh, the balance that we, we should have, have in everything. Uh, the more we know a few things, the more we see in common between them. But the more we know a few things, the more we find also the details that are different. So, yes, that's true to some extent because the body is the same. The, you know, the law the laws of physics, the laws of physiology are the same for everyone. So uh, to some ex extent, even actually, you don't, you don't need to, to use only martial arts. If you think of sports, for example, baseball or golf, uh, and you have your bat, you, you will still, still be willing to use your hips, you know, the swing, the way you use many different parts of your body to perform a technique in golf or in baseball or actually, for example, in basketball, you don't, you don't throw a basketball, a ball in basketball, only using your arms, you use your whole body, you use your legs. So there's a lot in right, common right. with other physical activities. So that's true. They, they become more similar. But for example, if you punch with your uh, whole body mass, like, uh, like a spear, that's a typical, that's not the only technique, kind of punching technique of old Thai karate. But if you use this specific kind of technique, if you punch like a spear uh, in a, using a straight thrust against the, the opponent's body, you, you would probably prefer to punch with your uh, uh, pointer and middle finger um, joints, you know, the, the joints. But if you punch like um, a series of hammers, hammers, um, like in a circular path without using your whole body mass, uh, you, you, you will use your body mass, but not the same way you, you want thrust like uh, a piston, uh, you can use other joints of your fist because, uh, uh, the th for example, the last three joints can't handle that, that amount of body weight. If you use all your body weight and uh, perform a thrusting punch, uh, you can damage your joints, but they are great to perform, for example, the classical Wing Chun style kind of punch. Um, I believe the, the Wing Chun style of punch, for example, is, is possibly because it's meant to be used by lighter people. Uh, Wing Chun, the Chinese martial arts is said to have been created. Uh, we don't know if it's, if it's true, but the legend says that a woman, had, uh, a woman created Wing Chun. Maybe that's f for that reason. The, the punches are different for, from those of karate because in karate we, we use more of our body mass, comparatively more of our body mass. That doesn't mean that Wing Chun doesn't use body mass. They use their wonderful punchers. Um, but if we use the last three joints of our hands, uh, of our fists, uh, with the same kinds of punches, it's easier for us to have that uh, well-known boxing fracture on the fists. Yeah, we, it's mm. easier to da damage our, our hands and our, our wrists. Uh, so those are kinds of differences. Yeah, I completely agree. Let's shift gears a little yeah. bit. Let's, we've talked a lot about martial arts and the martial arts you do, but we've talked very little about you. And I want to get to know more about okay. you. 
So you, you talked about growing up in a rough area in Brazil. I don't think you mentioned the city, though. What, yeah, the, name, the of the name of the city is Belém. It's Belém. Yeah, Belém. Uh, it, Belém. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's pretty much it. Oh, okay. it's the same name, you know, in Portuguese of the city where where uh, the the religious figure Jesus Christ was born. So that's the name of the city, Belém. And oh, okay. yeah, B E L E M. Oh, it's the the exact same city where famous. Cur Karate practitioner Lyoto Machida. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, he was he wasn't born in Belém, but he he was raised in Belém. <laughs> so that's well, a I'm sure we city. have a number of people right. watching who know that name. <laughs> yeah, he comes from that city. Well, oh, okay. Good, good stuff. Good stuff. And were you always interested in history? Oh, mm. I don't. I don't really think so, to be honest. No. Yeah. That surprises me. Yeah. Uh, what's the point in researching history of martial arts? Uh, I was only interested in martial arts that worked for me, that made me feel satisfied. Oh, this. I think this works. That's enough for me. And I didn't really even want to research. I. Uh, I wasn't planning to become a researcher, but. Um, you know why? Why uh, do I need to to stop playing video games? <laughs> you know, <laughs> or uh, riding my my skateboard? Why would I stop doing stuff that I like to research, to learn, to speak Japanese, all, all of those stuff? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would prefer to do the stuff that I was already doing. But uh, in order to understand better the martial arts. Which, which I was practicing, uh, I was for forced to study, to study its history. And the more I would study its history, indeed, the better, uh, the more satisfied I would become with, with the kind of martial arts that I was practicing. It's, uh, it wasn't the only kind of research that I did. I, I not only researched history, but researching history really helped make sense of everything else. Um, you know, uh, my particular research, there are a few people who know that and who know it today. Uh, mm, there are even a few famous people, you know, who, who said, this is awesome. Uh, like, for example, Jesse and Kemp, uh, the karate nerd, Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I met him a few times. I showed him uh, some of my research, and he said, "Wow, I have never seen anything equal in my life." Uh, that's something that he said. So, uh, if you don't believe me, ask him. <laughs> uh, he said that I could uh, repeat what he said, so I'm I'm okay with that. So, um, but uh, this research. Uh, I say that it's it's based on five pillars. Is that word correct? Pillar, pillar. Uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. sustentation. Yeah. Yes, it's based on f on five pillars. So it's um, historical research, um, con uh, contextual, strategic, and tactical research analysis. I, I prefer to call it analysis and. There's also um, technical research, which is biomechanical and physiological research analysis, again. Um, five, then the formal research, which is the analysis of uh, the old kata, the forms of karate. And then finally, um, test under pressure. So what I do today is based on those five pillars and history is just one of those pillars but it's extremely important because when i study history i get greater input on how to do things um, it's impressive how the old masters in very little time wrote so many great old style karate books uh, it would be great if we had more 
it would be wonderful to have more. Uh, we don't, but it's impressive that in just a few decades, they have already written a lot and those books are very useful. You know, not only to understand the history, I'm not talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about really the practical aspect of martial arts. You don't, you don't even need to be a karate practitioner to learn from those books. Uh, you, you have, you get, for example, one book, um, To the Jutsu no Kenkyo by Morinobu Itoma. Uh, um, th this guy, Morinobu Itoma, was a uh, Okinawan uh, law mm -hmm. uh, enforcement officer. And he wrote this book on old style karate. He, he didn't even use the word karate in his book. He called it Tode or Toji, that would be one of the old names for karate. And the kinds of, of teachings that he conveys in his book can be used by anyone who wants to learn uh, to fight for self-defense. He says, he, he even goes to say something, s s funny stuff like, okay, sometimes you can spit on the guy's face to buy time to to flee or to hit him somewhere. Uh, you can, uh, he, he's, he teaches stuff that is very unusual today, but that you can, can really use, uh, even though, even if you're not a karate practitioner, but if you're, uh, for example, a Krav Maga practitioner, a uh, Jiu-Jitsu practitioner focused on self-defense, You can use his teachings there. Even the technical teachings, I'm not talking only about spitting on people's faces, people's eyes, uh, but you can use the, the technical t uh, advice that he gives there. They're great books, really great books, but uh, it's not enough to just focus on the, on the technical part. It's best you will make sense of everything if you study history. So that's why I went into history. But um, I just study as much as necessary because, you know, time is limited for everyone. And I tend to focus on the technical aspect. There are many people out there who are doing a wonderful work on uncovering the, the history of martial arts, not only uh, Okinawan or Japanese martial arts, but, uh, you know, European martial arts. Uh, there are many people out there. And uh, for Okinawan martial arts, for karate, are some people doing some really wonderful stuff and wonderful work. And I'm very thankful for what they have done. And they are the real people of history of martial arts not they that they are not technicians uh, themselves but they have done a really wonderful work unveiling the history of those martial arts mm. right on <laughs> now we've spent most of our time today talking about the past whether yeah. it's your past or the past or karate so let's cool. really let's flip that let's talk about the future okay you mentioned that that you have a school and you have students yeah yeah so tell us about Tell us a bit about that. Tell us about what you're hoping comes from your, your understanding of Japanese and then being able to read yeah. and translate these texts and future training and all that. What's, what's going on in the future? Okay. Uh, you know, uh, my only intention in the beginning was to practice martial arts for myself, uh, to be satisfied with what I was doing. But there was a point uh, when I had come up with so many things uh, with the research that um, I found out that I needed to share, share it with other people. In fact, even my students uh, wanted me to share uh, other people. Um, I... I, I I talked about Jesse Kump. He, he asked me, what will you do if you die and this doesn't go published? <laughs> uh, so today I don't want this to, to be left, uh, you know, in my mind, in my computer. <laughs> you know, I, I want people to learn about this 
and to keep taking it forward because I'm just one person uh, and I, I don't treat this as the work of one person. It's, it's like science again, you know? Actually, uh, my research is based on scientific method, methodology. For example, we, we need to replicate everything we do. We need to test. We need to, to submit it to other people for them uh, to find mistakes. Uh, and that's something that, ha that has happened uh, many times. So I want to make more people be aware about it so they so first of all that this this understanding this knowledge will be passed on uh, it will become uh, known by everyone and the second thing that I want is for people to continue the work and not that I don't want to continue it myself but as I told you I'm just one person and uh, even though I'm working on it, there's no reason for me to be the only one working on it. In fact, there are other people uh, trying to do the same. And I think everyone needs to get together on this, to work together. Some people have really worked along with me, together with me. But unfortunately, uh, this doesn't happen all the time. One of the reasons... I believe this doesn't happen all the time. I understand it's part of the world. People are like that. Uh, things are not easy. So um, it's not that the other researchers are bad people. It's, it's not that. But uh, some people are trying to make money out of this research. And that's very valid. But for that reason, it's harder for them to work together with other researchers uh, because um, it becomes one kind of competition. Uh, and as I told you, uh, it's part of the world. Uh, uh, society is like that. We can understand, but uh, the hardest part is that sometimes uh, that competition even uh, prevents us from testing what each other is doing or from, uh, you know, from getting together and see what really works or what works better or what makes sense. So what I want to, to do is to make people know what I've been done. I'm actually working on this. Uh, for example, uh, just two years ago or three years ago, very, very, very few people would know what I'm doing. Almost only my students because my research would be private for the past years for many years um that research uh, i wouldn't i would never publish anything about it i would only discuss private privately with other researchers and teach my students uh, also my students are not really students they have never uh, i've never uh, taken students just to have students because I don't, I don't even charge for the classes. Not that I, I think that's a bad thing. Uh, I think it's totally valid. In fact, I, I, would, I would love to have a commercial school to some extent because it would help me. Uh, for example, if I lived on teaching martial arts, that would allow me to work on martial arts the whole the great for the greatest part of the day and today i don't do that i have a, a work a very nice job in brazilian government and uh, i teach martial arts there that's uh, a very special position but i don't teach martial arts there i don't research martial arts there for the greatest part of my day so uh what i would love to do is start teaching for uh, as my main job, you know, um, and share with as many people as possible, make them, them know uh, what I've been researching um, and make them contribute to that research, even by trying to falsify what I've been, my, the conclusions of my work. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and mm. with that, they can all start working together for, for I'll give you an example, okay? Uh, for example, if I have one kata, 
I, I told you something when we began this conversation. Uh, I told you that kata movements have a proper meaning, a correct meaning. Kata movements aren't free to interpretation. Uh, this might be not a very popular view, but to be honest, I'm very convinced of this. I have a lot of evidence uh, and never, never I told someone in person about this, showed it all the evidence and the person ended up uh, not agreeing. Everyone who sees that ends up agreeing. Wow, that's true. There's a real original meaning. And, of course, that meaning is not completely closed. It's the very opposite. There's a correct meaning of the kata, but it's fairly open to a great deal of variation. But you have to know, uh, you have to understand where you're coming from. And I, I want to show this to other people so they can understand the the reasoning behind this, behind all of this, and I will tell them, this is the rule that I used to interpret, to analyze this specific sequence of movements and this movements. These are all the rules, and I want to make, to know if this is true. Of course, I've been doing the research myself, and my students are my test subjects. My students, mm. my... Actually, my visitors, the people I visit also because I've been visiting other martial artists and inviting them and having other kinds of encounters to test martial arts, to test what I've been researching. So it's not something that I, I haven't been doing. I've been doing this for years, but I want to, to take it to more people. And um, for that, uh, probably the the easiest way to do it is to show in person because it's really um, you know martial arts are not uh, you you can begin easily but you take it every next level gets harder so it's mm. a complex matter it it requires a lot of time to explain and even after. I explained, for example, someone might, might very well doubt it. Oh, no, I don't believe this, that you're saying, Samir. Uh, you can be explaining this to me. Or, you know, I, I tell somebody about it, but the, the person might uh, not believe it. But if I show them in person, if I demonstrate, okay, so let's try to do this for real. Let's take safety measures. And then I show them for real. And that's how we finally, we, we can know for sure that it works. And there's something even better. After that, they can try it themselves. And they can test it with other people. And there are ways for testing it with other people as well. And that, those ways are, are something that martial artists have been doing for, you know, modern martial arts have been doing it already. They've been trying to test. But so far, uh, most tests they do uh, aren't completely, uh, it, those tests don't aim at understanding what works, for example, for self-defense. The tests are aim, for example, to see what works in a sport environment. So let's see, for example, an MMA match. An MMA match is a wonderful martial arts laboratory, but there, there is one problem with it. It only tests what works under MMA rules. It's not that good to test what works, for example, uh, for a self-defense context. Of course, it's better uh, than, uh, than never pressure testing what we do. Now, mar in martial arts is better, uh, at least because it's one kind of, uh, uh, test under pressure but if you try to test it under a specific environment uh, that tries to be just as close as possible from for example self-defense it helps you understand better 
what works for self-defense. Once, the specific martial arts that I'm focused on, which is old style karate, is aimed on self-defense. That's what I want to test. And that means we need to uh, have a different kind of testing. And it just turns out that the Okinawans, the old practitioners of uh, old style karate, the people from the Yukyu kingdom, they actually did have tests under pressure that they would use to see what worked and what didn't work. Uh, it wouldn't be exactly an MMA match. It's a little different because MMA has a few very restrictive rules. Of course, some of those pressure tests will be especially, especially dangerous but you can you can put different kinds of rules that try to get you just as close as possible and at the same time t try to keep things um safe just as safe as possible uh while keeping the realism of your test for example think of a wrestling match a wrestling match is great uh, to test uh, grappling techniques but uh, the striking techniques are lacking. Okay, so when you add the striking techniques, maybe you get a little closer to MMA. But um, there's there are a few things that don't work very well uh, when you compare MMA to self-defense because in self-defense, you can't just run away. And you can't do, do that in MMA. Uh, you can't run away. At the same time, you can manage time and distance. And that's something that you can't do very well, at, just as well, in self-defense. Uh, you, don't, you don't manage, you don't keep manage, managing time and distance in self-defense. You fight, or you flee, or you die. It's, uh, there are different self-defense contexts, uh, contexts, so I'm being a little simplistic here, but most self-defense Real self-defense scenarios, I'm not talking about street fighting. I'm talking about life protection only. Uh, most self-defense scenarios are very quick. They happen very quickly and at close range. So when you, when you think of that, you can try to create a, a kind of pressure test that is mainly focused on something that happens fast, quickly and in close range. And when you do that, you create a new kind of contest. One of the things I'm trying to do in the future is to establish uh, open pressure tests. Would we call it a sport? Well, uh, I'm kind of afraid of calling it a sport, but in the end, it's a little like that. Imagine uh, some kind of MMA match where the practitioners can't just keep uh, at a distance. Why? Why can't they keep at a distance? Because that's not a realistic self-defense situation. Uh, if you keep at a distance from a, a real aggressor, the aggressor will close in. Uh, maybe there are many aggressors. There are two. And if there are two, uh, you can keep a distance from one of them, but probably the other one will try to to get you from behind and so on. There are many differences. So one of my plans for the future is to have also open contests um, to invite people so that we can pressure test uh, martial arts techniques. And that's uh, actually, that actually already has a name. It's uh, a historical name. It, ha it also, it actually has two names. Uh, some people in the Yukyu kingdom would call it, call it kakidamishi, or in Japanese, it would be kakidamishi. And some of them would also call it um, kake kumite, that's a Japanese expression. And mm -hmm. that's a, a kind of pressure test for martial arts, but aiming at self-defense techniques. What, how about the techniques that are, that are not allowed? For example, in MMA, uh, striking the back of the head. In Kakedameshi, we can agree 
that strike in the back of the head is allowed, but you can't really do it for, you know, for real. But if someone's neck, if, if someone's backup head is exposed, you can show a, uh, an attack, you know, simulate one kind of attack, and uh, the practitioners w will understand that that attack happened and it would be a very, very dangerous attack. It would be a very effective attack. Um, there could be someone else from outside uh, judging if it, whether it would work or not for a self-defense scenarios, and that will help practitioners stop being exposed to techniques which are very effective but are not not allowed in in sport contexts it will also would also help them be conditioned to to use those techniques if they ever need to for self defense so my plans of, for the future are to make more people aware of this research uh, I have my school, but it's not just a school. Actually, it's it's a research society. Its name is mm. Mui Dokan Karate Kenkyo Kai. It means Mui Dokan Research Karate Research Society, and it happens to uh, uh, that there is a school within the research society because we teach people to promote and to test what we do. Um, but it's actually a research society. My idea is to promote to promote Muidokan. Uh, that includes teaching people in person, uh, you know, through seminars. I've already been teaching seminars uh, across Brazil. People from other countries have been inviting me to teach seminars in those countries, but I don't know exactly when I'm going to do that because I need to to conciliate those, uh, uh, though, you know, traveling to other countries uh, takes a lot of time and I have my main job, which is a completely different thing. Uh, so I need to, to make sure that I can teach and at the same time I can keep working unless I, you know, I quit my job and start teaching for <laughs> real time. But that's very yeah. hard, especially in Brazil. And uh, I have a good job. So uh, <laughs> it's not something well, we, that... We don't want you giving that up easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, so that's one of the things I want to do. The other thing is just uh, to promote. It's pretty much the same thing, but I want to establish one kind of competition a format, a pressure test format to help more people test uh, what they're trying to learn for self-defense. Um, it doesn't need to be big. It doesn't even need to be especially popular, even though I think it would be very popular because, you know, uh, in, think of a MA match. Uh, it's a little like that, but with a few further safety measures and at the same time a few um a few more open rules in terms of allowing more techniques more techniques would be allowed even techniques for example that you can perform even if your opponent is far stronger than you uh once mma uh forbids the most effective techniques for example it also forbids exactly the techniques that allow a weaker, physically weaker person to subdue a stronger person. Uh, to some extent, of course, a weaker person sure. can still um, uh, subdue a stronger person, but it gets, it gets harder if you can't uh, strike, uh, strike them, for example, on the back of the head, if you can't strike them, if you can't manipulate small joints, if you can't uh, attack the eyes. I know there's a whole big uh, discussion about how effective attacking the eyes are, so I, I don't want to get into this, but it's something that um, I think anyone sh would be able to agree that it works. Uh, sure, how much sure. it works is a different matter. But if, if it didn't work, it if it didn't work at all, really, it wouldn't even be forbidden, the matches to begin with. So uh, 
that's one of the things that I want to do. The promoting yeah. the research, the contest, uh, the contest format, the sportive, so to speak, format. Uh, probably travel a little bit to a few countries. I, I'm trying to. I'm thinking of. I'm planning to travel to Okinawa to promote what I'm doing. But uh, I have a very a, a baby girl now. She has. She is one year and three months now. So I need. I need to wait a, a little bit until she gets a little older, and then I'm going to travel to Okinawa and show what I'm doing. And uh, I hope I'm doing this right now. I'm promoting <laughs> the research through through <laughs> talking to you. I'm actually very very glad that we are talking for for that very Thank reason. You. And and we are and we are promoting it. And I know you sent over some links. So why don't you let people know? Of course, to anyone listening, unless it's their first episode, they know that we link these at the show notes. But uh, where where can people go to check out? Okay, what you're doing? Okay, um, that's great. Uh, uh, first of all, we have a website. Um, it's called muidokan. It's at muidokan dot com. Muidokan uh, is spelled uh m u i d o k a n it's muidokan.com but we also have a fan page and, and facebook with the same name muidokan uh, people can call for my name you know people can google it uh, actually but my name is not easy for those who speak english it's br typical brazilian name brazilian names are a, a mix of many nationalities so it's samir samir berardo berardo is an italian name um s-a-m-i-r that's samir and then berardo it's b-e-r-a-r-d-o uh they can look for the fan page and facebook for my tweet twitter that is samir berardo for my for my instagram that is samir berardo as well uh and uh they can also uh, search for one video that is in YouTube that I have recorded with. I made the video with Jesse and Kump, the karate nerd. And uh, that was uh, in an, uh, a very peculiar occasion when I went to a seminar by Jesse and Kump. But he already, he was already, he knew part of my research. We already knew each other. And I told oh, him, cool. yeah. Uh, because you know he's a researcher as well, and most res most researchers are aware of each other. Some of them are friends. I think this is the best thing when when we are friends. Some of them, uh, most most of them, are very civil with each other. I'm very happy for that. It's a it's a nice environment, and uh, not all the time because you know that's human people, but. Uh, we already knew each other and I told him, hey, I'm going to your seminar, so what if we take some time for me to show you a little bit more about my research? And when I showed him my research, he said, uh, oh, that's something that I have never displayed, uh, uh, I have never said in public. So this is the first time that I say what Justin Kamp said himself. So he said, I have never seen this before, I've never seen uh, bunkai, so advanced. What's bunkai? Bunkai is, in in brief words, uh, the act of analyzing and understanding the meaning of kata, of forms. So he said he had never seen such an advanced bunkai. And he suggested that we would re make a video together uh, with bunkai with explanation of any kata that I wanted to explain. And after we, we would made that video, he would edit the video and publish it. And that's exactly what we did. So there is um, a video uh, of myself explaining uh, the, the meaning. That's just a basic meaning, but it's uh, Jesse Kamp put in the in the title of the video advanced because it's advanced you know for most practitioners it's kind of advanced and i'm explaining the meaning of each and every movement of of one kata which is naihan chishodan uh, i have done the same to really really many kata from the first to the last movements with 
uh, layers and layers of depth of explanations, of tactical explanations, of biomechanical explanations, of a teaching methodology to make people really become able to apply that under real pressure, under, you know, for real. Uh, it's not just demonstrations. It's something that um, we we are able to learn and then to apply for ourselves. Uh, in fact, there is one comment from a Brazilian person. It's uh, the name is Ivan Ivan Zonta, if I remember correctly. I believe it's the most liked comment in Jesse in the video. It's on YouTube, and Ivan Zonta says something like this: "I've uh, Samir. I, I met Samir in a seminar in Brazil, and he applied that to me against me, even though." I wasn't willing to let him apply it to me. Uh, he, he described uh, an experience that we had together because we were really met in a Brazilian seminar uh, by uh, one of my instructors, uh, who is, uh, the instructor is Kohosaku Yokota. He is a Japanese, a great Japanese instructor. And we went, both of us went to the seminar and we met in Brazil. And to my surprise, he recognized me from the video that Jason Kamp and I made together. So I offered to show him um, for real how that worked, even though he would try to fight me as much as he, as he could. And I was able to, to do that against him. So that's a, a first-hand account, but there are many people who have done that with me. Or I have done that with many people now. Uh, I teach seminars across Brazil, and I show it to people to make that to see, to show that it really works. So I recommend people to go to YouTube and to to search Samir Samir. That's my name, uh, Naihanchi Bunkai, or Samir Naihanchi Bunkai Jesse, because it's a video that it is in Jesse Camp's channel in YouTube. That I believe it's the only video. Uh, in Jesse Camp's channel that has the level exclusive. <laughs> it's because when Jesse Camp, when I showed him my work, he was very excited and he was very emphatic, emphatic that he wanted to see, that he, he thought that was very, very important to show everyone. So he put the, the level exclusive. Uh, and he did it in front, uh, he, he said, Everything that I'm saying here that he said about my work, he said in front of many other people. So <laughs> you can ask the other. It's quite, yeah. it's quite the honor. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. And, it, it, and, it was really an honor because Jesse Kemp is a wonderful practitioner and research, uh, researcher himself. And he's been an inspiration for me uh, for many, many years. And he is still is. So... Mm. Anyway, I recommend people to look for this video, this Night Hunch video, and there are many other videos in my own YouTube account and Facebook. Facebook is the source where we have more stuff published. Awesome. So that's it. Awesome. We're going to link all that. We'll we'll link the the YouTube video. We'll make sure yeah. we make it easy for people Thank to you. find Thank it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, that's good. Of course. Of course. And this has been wonderful. I've had a great time talking with you. <laughs> and I'd, I'd like you to decide how you send us out. We always ask the guests, you know, what parting words, what wisdom, what advice, you know, whatever you want to call it. Wow. What final thoughts would you give to the listeners today? Okay. Well, the, um, okay. The martial arts world is very, you know, it's very big people practice martial arts for many re reasons and uh everyone uh, uh if they have if they're happy with what you're doing that is good enough people should practice martial arts uh because they get happy i believe that's the most important thing when we practice martial arts, we need to, to be happy. And because, especially because when we are happy with what we are doing, we keep doing it. And also we, the martial arts become something better. Uh, martial arts should be practiced by people who are happy with what you're doing. But 
the special kind of martial arts that I mostly focused on is self-defense martial arts or practical martial arts, you know, applied martial arts. It's a different kind. Uh, it's different from, for example, uh, aesthetic, you know, uh, martial arts for presentations. It's different for a little different from sport competition martial arts. It's more open. And everyone, I, I would say that everyone who is looking for martial arts that work on a, on a real context, on a you know, real pressure context, I think they should do their best to check, to test it. Uh, so, uh, when I began practicing martial arts, you know, I I tried to test from the very beginning, but uh, there were a few years when I trained under karate instructors that would teach me to do things that I was very suspicious that wouldn't work if I tried to do, to apply those things against uh, an unwilling partner. And against someone who was really fighting me. So I believe that this, this feeling of suspic suspiciousness uh, about something that people are teaching us is some, something very common for martial arts practitioners. And I believe there is no reason for us to keep feeling like that because uh, when we feel like that, it diminishes, it, it makes us feel less happy with what we're doing. But there are ways of testing, uh, you know, uh, ask a friend, uh, may I try to apply this against you and you will not let me apply it and let's try to see how it works. But of course, above all, this, this needs to be done with safety measures, of course. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is try to figure out what really works and don't don't just accept um, it's not a it's not disrespect against our instructor um, if we if we feel suspicious we can pretty much ask our instructor to demonstrate you know with safety carefully but we need to see if it works if we're focused on practical martial arts, we need to see if it works. It's the same thing, for example, in science. If we're, if I try to come up with a new cell phone, a, a mobile phone technology, I can't just sell the cell phone saying that it works. And when people try to turn, try to turn it on, it doesn't even turn on, or or it doesn't do what I'm claiming it to do. Science needs to work. So I believe it should be the same thing for martial arts. If we are, of course, for those who are interested in pragmatic and practical martial arts, of course, uh, if they just want to practice martial arts for the beauty, for the philosophy, that's great. Uh, but if they're interested in practical martial arts, my message is test it and look for more people who are trying to test it because uh, today it's easier for people to communicate with each other. And uh, so it's easier to test. Uh, and when more people speak out that they are trying to see what works, it's easier for them to get together, to test, to see what works, and finally bring a real evolution for martial arts. I love hearing people talk about what gets them fired up about their training, about their understanding of what they do and why they do it. And I felt like we got a bit of a window into who Sensei Berardo is with this episode. Because if you understand why someone does something, you get to understand a lot about who they are. And that's what I felt was on full display today. So thank you so much for coming on, sir. Had a great time. Hope to talk to you again. If you want more, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. There you can find videos and links and social media and, well, more. Just more. Not just for this episode, but every single episode we've ever done. If you're down to support the work that we do, well, 
you can do quite a few things. You can make a purchase at whistlekick.com. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 to get 15% off. Or you could share an episode, leave a review, tell a friend, or contribute to the Patreon. That's patreon.com slash whistlekick. And remember, if you see somebody wearing a Whistlekick hat or a shirt out there, talk to them. Say hello. Ask them about their favorite episodes or how they found the company. Because what do you know when you see them wearing that? You know that they train. And if you train and they train, maybe you can be friends. Who doesn't want more friends that train? I do. Why do you think I do this? And if you have suggestions for guests or topics or other things, let's hear them. You can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com, and you can follow us at Whistlekick all over the place. That brings this episode to a close. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 